walk in the way of the wicked, who does not stand in the way of sinners, and who does not sit in the seat of the scoffer. Remember, that was Psalm 1, the first two verses laying out for us a choice, the way of the wicked or the way of the man who delights in the law of the Lord, those who would be planted near a tree, not like the way of the wicked, who are the chaff that are blown away, but planted by the tree, or plant, planted as a tree by the living water that gives life. And so Psalm 1, again, lays that choice out before us. It's the reason it's Psalm 1. It says, here is the option, and you will falter or have victory in a life with God based upon which path you choose. And so that's where we've been. We've been in the Psalms. These Psalms, these ancient poems that have the greatest truths in them about God just as much as any part of the rest of our Bible, and that they always focus on God. It's interesting, as we said before, to see the passion of the psalmist. We see it at its very heights, and today we'll see it at its very low points, but they don't hold anything back. They're not attempting to dance around an issue or to sound elite or sophisticated. Uh, there's no limit to the expression of the soul in the Psalms. Last week, we had five types of Psalms, three that were hymns. You remember the hymn of creation, the Psalm about the creation, that God is creator, the Psalm of the divine king, and which we said was the chief theme of all the psalms, that God is king. And if we don't remember anything else, the psalms proclaim the kingship, the divine kingship of God. The psalms, the hymns of the redeemer, that God is redeemer. And then psalms of thanksgiving that are more personal, that I'm giving thanks for something that God has done for me. And then also uh, the fifth one we looked at uh, as exampled by Psalm 23 the Psalms of confidence, that I'm not in a perfect spot right now, but I know I'm about to be because I know my deliverance is coming. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me, the Psalm of confidence. However, um, while all those are true, while the theology is correct, while God is creator, redeemer, while we do give him thanks, while we do have confidence, while he is king, as one author said, we were created to live with God in a garden. Yet every day, we wake up in the desert of a fallen world. And so, in the fallen world, how do we respond? And in there, we have our largest body of psalms. And that is the laments, the laments of the Psalms. And that's where we'll be today, looking at several of the laments. We'll start, for instance, with David. And we've read Psalms of David, and David enraptures us with the greatest phrases ever penned about the glory of God and about praising him. No one can take us to the heights of God's kingdom like the pen of of David as he's guided by the Spirit. But we may think, well, yeah, of course. He was just the runt of his family, out, forgotten. Remember his dad, didn't even remember he had that son out in the field? If you're the youngest, you may, you know, today if you're the youngest, you're the baby and you're coddled, but not, not in the ancient world, not when you've got a dozen or so. Oh, he's the one out in the field taking care. And all of a sudden, the great prophet Samuel comes to him and anoints him. He defeats the giant. He becomes king. He defeats uh, the, the Philistines, the Jebusites. He builds Jerusalem. He creates the great army of God and spreads uh, the territories. And it's a great time. Wouldn't you expect uh, him to have some, some pretty optimistic poems that he might write? I mean, there's nothing like that on my resume. Killed the giant, conquered the city, became king at a very young age. And so, do these psalms really speak to us? Can, I mean, David, sure, he was one of us back then. But does he still remember what it's like 
in the day to day? Well, ironically, we also see some of the most dire laments from the same psalmist. Because while David was the king, David the warrior, David the man after God's own heart, David was also uh, David the adulterer, David the fugitive, David the murderer, David the absentee father. And so, uh, unlike most of us who like to hang somewhere in the middle of life, David was, when he was good, he was really good. And when he was bad, he was really bad. And some of us are in between. But we see these laments from David as well. Uh, Psalm 3 is titled, uh, The Psalm of David as he fled from his son Absalom. And so we think he can conquer giants, he runs a kingdom, but he can't even keep his own boy in check. And he laments over that. That grieves him. He's supposed to be king, and it's within his own family that turmoil erupts, and he ends up spending a significant amount of his time running for his life from his own son, stemming somewhat from some of his own sins and lack of being involved in his family. But we say, well, sure, David's a, he, he stands out, but he, he's different, right? Because he... It was the best of times and the worst of times, and I'm somewhere in the middle. But laments aren't just tied to David. Many laments were written by other psalmists. We have a huge number of laments in the Old Testament. The book of Job is primarily a lament. God promises Abraham that he will multiply his descendants all over Canaan. And it seems that from that point on, every woman that his children marries happens to be barren. And so all these women, we have laments and God grants them children. Even after that, Hannah, the same thing. We have the prophets who lament, kings who lament, priests who lament. We have some in the New Testament. We have an entire book by Jeremiah entitled Lamentations, which is a lament. And so we may think, well, what do we do with all these? Uh, um, you know, how might they apply to us? But we're looking at the Psalms and roughly 50 of our 150 or one-third of the psalms are in this category of lament. It's the largest category we have. And so we'll deal with them and we'll ask the question, uh, how does this speak to me as a New Testament believer? What is all this lamenting business? Is it a Christian thing to do to lament? Or if not, uh, what do we learn from our ancient forebears of faith who have lamented uh, with great passion? As I've looked into these, I found that primarily these laments are at first, I thought, well, maybe there are weaknesses of faith. I want to stay away from lamenting because I'm not affirming the victory I have in Christ, perhaps. However, it looks like, as most of the laments in the Psalms are, they are expressions of faith in a time of trial. And so that's a quick definition of how I might define a lament. Is it's a different type of expression of faith during a time of trial. One author spoke of all the psalms we did last week of king, redeemer, creator, thanksgiving, confidence, as the psalms of orientation. I have all my beliefs right. God is where he should be. I'm where I should be. The created order is just so-so. It's all in this sphere, and it's all oriented well, psalms of orientation. And he calls these psalms the psalms of disorientation. Everything is still true as it was before. I don't, my theology or beliefs about God haven't changed. It's simply that I'm in a spot now that's disoriented. I know the promises of God. I know what he offers, but that's not what I'm experiencing at this point. And so the biblical response of faith for our forebearers was lament. And so I thought, well, maybe I can start lamenting instead of complaining, right? Or arguing. You know that passage in the New Testament, do everything without arguing or complaining, the most disobeyed passage uh, in my house. And so, uh, well, maybe I can take on the lament and I can have a biblical way to argue and complain. Uh, however, it doesn't really work that way because as I look at what is really something that is lamentable, truly biblically lamentable, it's not uh, the types of things that we typically argue or complain about. Uh, laments are big deals. Okay? They're not inconveniences. Uh, 
Uh, it's not being stuck in traffic. It's not even a broken toe. Okay? It's not uh, batteries not included or slow down loads or raining on your parade. It's, it's something that is much more severe and our biblical precedents for laments are things like famine, pestilence, war, disease, um, sometimes grievous personal sin that has just overwhelmed my soul. And so they're not the small things, but they're big things. So I don't really want to have to lament that often. I don't want something of that magnitude in my life. I don't, I'd like to have the high points that David lived, but I really don't want those low points. Um, and so how do we do it? What's it involved? What does a lament actually look like? What is the lamenter actually uh, saying about God as he laments? Well, as they're expressions of faith in trial, we find that the lament always starts with the basic assumption on the part of the one who is lamenting as God hears. You wouldn't lament if God didn't listen. God is there. I know he's king. I know he's redeemer. I know he's creator. I know he's there, and I know he hears. And so the beginning of a lament in the Psalms is typically assuming that there is a God, he is good, and he listens to the prayers of his people. That's the first affirmation of faith for one that laments. The lamenter has actually a grand vision of how God has oriented his universe and how he wants it to run, how he wants us to live. The lamenter does not suffer, as so many do, from spiritual apathy. He knows. He has a grand vision. He's been there. He's seen the glory and the victory of God. He knows the history of God's people and the glory that's associated with seeing God's kingdom reign. And so he's also acutely aware, though, that the spot that he happens or she happens to be in is not that vision. I'm not experiencing the vision that I know that God has planted in the world. And I want that. I want that vision of God. I want to see the blessing of God. And so I lament. I know God hears. I know who God is. I'm not just a whiner or a complainer. Uh, laments aren't typically done by the people who are evil or just want a better life or just want the easy road. These are people who want all of God and they're lamenting after that. It's not just griping or complaining or political action or um, whatever, all those other things that we may do, which uh, it, it's something entirely different. And it's saying that God responds to something. And some of the laments sound quite difficult. Uh, some of them are what we call precatory laments, where uh, God, would you, I, I'm being chased by my enemies, uh, the enemies of you, they're, they're attacking your army. Uh, would you defeat those enemies? So that sounds maybe perhaps spiritually cruel or greedy. Uh, yet we're dealing with the people in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant law. And in Deuteronomy uh, 26 and 27, God lays out very clear, these are the people, if you choose to obey my covenant and follow my commands, there's the blessings that are going to be associated with that. They went over to the other mountain that was uh, desolate, and then they would read the curses. And if you choose not to follow my ways and ignore my laws and not have faith in me, these are the curses that are associated with this. And so many times the lamenter is simply calling on God to act according to the blessings and the curses that he's promised in his original, uh, in the covenant of the law. And so they're not necessarily vindictive it's just God this is the order you've laid out this is the orientation you have the enemies are coming upon us and so take care of it these laments will have a particular type of structure and one of the fascinating things to find about how the lament is structured is it's usually an, a confession that God hears God is good God wants what's best and he can intervene and then I typically have the lament. What is the problem that's going on? What is the turmoil? What is the agony? 
be it physical, mental, or spiritual, or national. What is that agony? And then they typically will conclude with an affirmation of God's goodness again. The lament is sandwiched in between the affirmation of who God is and what he really wants. And they follow most closely the same exact structure as we saw last week in the Psalms of Thanksgiving. I know who God is. This is what God has done for me in Thanksgiving. And then I conclude with my last stanza about the goodness of God. And many believe that many of the Psalms of Thanksgiving that we have in our Bible are answers, responses to the earlier psalms of lament in which God answered. And so then the psalmist, led by the Spirit, will now write a new psalm. And he can simply replace the lament section in the middle with a thanksgiving section. And sometimes we'll have a psalm of lament and thanksgiving and lament and thanksgiving. And it looks like that's what they're doing. They don't give us the details of, of exactly everything that's happened, but it looks like many of our psalms of thanksgiving were actually responses to the Psalms of Laments, when God had come through and uh, reoriented the life of the psalmist. With these laments, we have personal laments, and we also have community laments, uh, but they're all used uh, together in worship. And so if you're lamenting something, you might uh, have a diary or a blog or a journal or something, and it's something that's really close tied to your heart and it's for your eyes only you're not going to be sharing uh, you know you're not going to be airing your dirty laundry all over or what you're going through perhaps uh, it wasn't so with the ancients uh, they would have that very deep and personal turmoil they would go through spiritually they would write that down and then they would use that in public worship and the psalms were designed for that and so uh, uh, Psalm 102 is an example of a very personal uh, diary entry type of suffering. And then down in verse 18, he says, but this will all be written down for the generations to come. I want everyone to know what I've gone through. Because if God answers my prayer, he doesn't just answer my prayer because I'm an individual. He answers my prayer. He answers my uh, concern as part of the community of God's people. They're all one, just as the church is one. There's something to be learned there, that there, there wasn't this sense of, of this is just my private life with God, and then we'll just sing about the good stuff when we get together. There's this sense of sharing everything because it's a testimony to me to know that God has brought you out of despair. It's a testimony to you to know that God has brought me out of despair. So in my deepest, most horrible fear, maybe even faith-testing experiences, those are publicly written down in the Psalms, and we worship, we sing these back and forth as a group because they're not really seen as individuals. They're seen as the people of God. And so they are written down for us, for all of us. We'll take a look at some of these that are community and personal and the first one we'll look at is, a, is written again for the community by perhaps uh, a group of priests by the sons of Korah and that doesn't tell us a whole lot in terms of who that is but it's a general community lament and so as I read Psalm 44 you can listen to what does the beginning and the end of the Psalms say about God. We'll see the lament in the middle. All we really know historically is that um, they've, they've lost a battle. We don't know when this was. We have no idea. And in some ways, there's some benefit to not knowing because we can generalize this and apply it perhaps in different situations. All we know is that this is God's army they were just defeated, and now they lament. What does it say about God? Psalm 44, we have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in the days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand, but them, our fathers, you planted. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out. 
For they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. But it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance, because you favored them. You are, God, you are king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through you we will push down our enemies. Through your name we will trample those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies, and have put to shame those who hated us. In God we boast all day long, and praise your name forevermore. But you have cast us off and put us to shame, and you do not go out with our enemies. You make us turn back from the enemy, and those who hate us have taken spoil for themselves. You have given us up like sheep intended for food, and have scattered us among the nations. You sell your people for next to nothing, and are not enriched by selling them. You make us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to those all around us. You make us a byword among the nations, a shaking of the head among the peoples. My dishonor is continually before me, and the shame of my face has covered me. Because of the voice of him who reproaches and reviles, because of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, but we have not forgotten you, nor have we dealt falsely with your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. You have severely broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a foreign God, would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Awake! Why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise, do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to dust. Our body clings to the ground. Arise for our help and redeem us for your mercy's sake. A defeated army. This isn't you win some, you lose some. This is the Lord's army. The promise of old is that they would take over the land and defeat the peoples. But they haven't. And they recite that history. They're, they're, again, they're de, the, the Hebrews are defined by their history with God from uh, Moses, Joshua, the giving of the law, the taking of the land. And now things are not going well. But it's not simply a complaint. It's not simply that they're upset that they were outgunned. Everything they say is in the context of the relationship that they have with God. The relationship that they have where they say, you are my king, O God. The relationship where God takes care, where God commands. And so they don't get together and come up with a plan for the second attack. They don't raise funds to hire mercenaries for next time. They're not looking for more advanced weaponry. They know as the kingdom of warriors who fight for the name of God that only God is their victory and so they go nowhere else and so the lament only goes to God as the only resource for victory and here they are defeated and it's not so much that they actually spend more time talking about the dishonor of God's name because they're God's people than they do actually talking about the military defeat it's the fact that as they might remember Psalm 1, it's, these are the wicked who are attacking us. They're supposed to be the chaff blown by the wind. They're the ones who just ran off with all our stuff. They took the spoils of, of your people. And now they're over there in their temple worshiping their God, saying that their God is stronger than our God. It's that dishonor that's the greatest defeat. And it's out of that defeat that they're attempting to come to grips with how does God now answer? How does God come through? And after the defeat, how do we still go forward? And so they don't uh, try any other thing besides going to God, and they ask God now to act, to intervene. And they don't know why they failed. As far as they know, we've followed your law, we've followed your covenant, but it could be something uh, similar to what happened to Joshua. Right after they defeat Jericho, the next battle... At AI, you remember they're defeated, they're routed. 
And wait a second, we just, we just conquered the most powerful city on the planet, marching around it. And, it, and the walls fell, and now we're defeated by, by this little group over here the next day? What happened? Well, you remember, Achan had stolen some of the devoted things to God, and Joshua laments, he complains, what happened? And he says, no, Israel has sinned. The devoted things must be taken care of before you can now move on into victory. Possibly something like that. Achan, what seemed like one private sin, affected the whole community, just as these laments affected the whole community. Whether you were a warrior or not, you would sing this lament, and you would wait upon God to come through. And so they bow down to God, waiting for him to come back. And they defend God. They say, even in their defeat, the lesson of the lament is, in their defeat, they still claim, you are my king, not my defeated king, not we're going to fire our generals and maybe get a new set of recruits. You're the king with you as victory. And so out of that expression of faith comes the lament for the community that they would all sing. And if they lost another battle, they would perhaps re-sing this together as a community, searching for God amidst the turmoil. This expression of still, we know God is not weak. We know he will come through. We're waiting on God, and so we lament. Other laments are different. We have the, the community laments that follow that basic pattern, all saying together. And sometimes it's not a, I'm not lamenting because the army just routed my army or because there's famine or pestilence or I'm being chased, such as David was by Absalom or Saul. It's not persecution. Sometimes the enemy is within. The enemy is my own sin, and so we have a group of seven psalms called the penitential psalms in which I'm coming to God and I am repenting and dealing with a sense of sin that I simply cannot deal with or overcome. And so our example for that it will be Psalm 130, this penitential psalm. This was Luther's, uh, Martin Luther, our, uh, his favorite psalm. He prayed this, he taught over it, he preached over it as he was struggling in anguish as the father of the Reformation on saying, in the system I'm in, I'm not sensing the power and forgiveness of God. And so in this psalm, he saw uh, the gospel in infancy in this psalm. There's a half a dozen like this, that this is really like the gospel that we can find. So as I read it, this short Psalm 130, Again, you can maybe see that. Have you been in the, in the depths? And do you see the gospel? Do you see what it says about God? This expression of faith in time of trial. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. You see the infancy of the gospel there, the great truths about God. And so this expression of faith happens, your translation may say pit or depths. He's underground. Wherever he's at, it's not in a good spot, right? Out of the depths, I have cried to you, O Lord. So we know that's where he's at. Hear my voice. Let your ear be attentive. And so his first thing is he's not, he doesn't ask for a ladder from someone else to get out of the pit. He doesn't join a program. He doesn't uh, try to give himself positive self-talk. He doesn't take a class. Uh, 
he has one recourse, and that's always what it is in the lament. It's only God can get me out of this pit. I can't crawl out. I, I can't call someone else for help because who else can deal with the issue of sin that I'm wretched with? Only God. And so his first supplication is just, as it usually, Lord, hear me. He knows that even in the pit, even in the depths, that only God can hear. And that it is even by grace that God will give him a lending ear to hear his complaint. And so that's him. He's in the pit. And then verse 3 is us. As I said before, the Psalms we don't just see as casual observers. They call us in. They include us. Verse 3, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? And so who's the who there? Well, that's everybody. That's us. Who can stand in their own sin before a holy God? That's his question. This theological statement he makes as he's in agony of the pit in the depths. Who can stand? And of course the answer is no one. I can't stand. There's no other recourse when I lament, I only lament to God, affirming his goodness. And then verse 4 is the spiritual foundation for his lament. But there is forgiveness with you. There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. We may not typically phrase it like that. Is there, there's forgiveness so God may be feared? But it's the one who's lamenting, who depends so utterly on the mercy of God, is the one who is also so dependent upon his holiness. And so there's this fear, this holy fear, because remember, even in the pit, I still know he's king. I still fear the king. The king isn't casual. He is still redeemer. He is still creator. So from the pit, I cry out, Lord, I know that you forgive, and I fear you even out of that forgiveness. I wait for the Lord. My soul is waiting. He's in the pit, and in his word, I do hope. We can amen that. In, in whose word do you hope? In the word of the Lord. And even in the psalmist in the pit knows that God's word is good, God's word is blessing. I don't know how God's going to get me out of this pit. I don't, I don't know how it's going to happen. But I know that I'm not going to try any other option but depending upon God to get me out. Because only God can forgive sins. Only the king can take care of this problem. In his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than those who watch in the morning. This was the image. Remember the Psalms, they always give us pictures not just ideas, and the images at the front gate of the city, you have the night watchmen. Their job is one of the hardest jobs you can imagine. In pitch black, they're supposed to see everything going on. There's no lights, but will the enemy attack at night? And so if your job is the night watchman, your whole job description is to see in the dark something that no one can do. And so you spend all night just, just peering eastward for the sun to rise. And then you know, your shift is done, the enemy didn't attack. And so just as that night watchman is waiting for the sun to rise, so, Lord, I'm waiting upon you. Now, we can say as a New Testament believer that, you know, wh where's the assurance here of his forgiveness? It really doesn't tell us. Was he waiting for the next sacrifice for atonement? Was it a prophet that would give him a word? Would God give him a vision or speak to him in some way? We're not, not really sure. We know we have assurance of our forgiveness, and we took communion to testify to that fact. Uh, but this Old Testament saint, he has the ceremonial system, yet he doesn't even mention it here. And many of the laments and other psalms, uh, some will mention, oh, I will make another offering to the Lord. And some say, well, Lord, we know we make our offerings, but, but you're looking for our heart, for our obedience. And so his assurance will come as he waits upon the Lord some way. He knows that he will be forgiven because God forgives. And so then verse 7 and 8, 
as he concludes, he just opens us up for a song to the entire nation now. He's in the pit still, you see. He's still underground. But he'll say, O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him there is abundant redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. The sufferer, the psalmist in the pit, has now become the evangelist, has now become the missionary to the entire nation of Israel based upon his proclamation because he knows who God is. His soul is distraught, he is disoriented, he is weighed down with his sin, but he has faith in God. And so he laments out of faith and he expresses that deep yearning, that waiting for God to forgive in the same breath he proclaims God's forgiveness to the nations and saying, only God can do this. This is who we are as a people, Israel. And so what do these laments have for us? I might not have to wait. I have an assurance of my forgiveness, but I don't necessarily always have the victory over the effects of sin. I, uh, and so today, have, have, you ever, have you ever felt defeated as a defeated army? You ever felt like you've been in the pit? We could complain. We could gripe, say we deserve better. Or we could proclaim God's goodness, speak to God. Lord, right now it seems that here or over here, uh, defeated, in the pit. Can you still proclaim God's goodness? Can you still be oriented and know the truth? Can you still from that pit say, our hope is in the Lord. He is mercy, forgiveness, redemption. That even though I don't feel like I'm part of the kingdom right now, that he is still king. That's the nature of biblical lament, and that's our choice that the psalmist leaves us with. I don't want to pray that you will experience many laments in your life. However, as Jesus promised us suffering in this life, um, it is sure to come. Can I still affirm who God is, can I still speak of his greatness from the defeated in the battlefield, from the sin in the pit, from life in the depths? Do I still know that he is king? Let's pray. Lord, you've chosen to teach us by our forefathers not only that life is not always easy, but that we don't always experience the spiritual victory that perhaps we think we should. And we, we ask that in those times, you will remind us of your great word, that you are king, that we don't give in to walking in the way of the wicked, that we don't give in to complaining or thinking we deserve something better, but that, Lord, from the pits of life, from the depths of despair, being defeated individually or as a group, when the world, when the satanic, when our own flesh gets the best of us, that we can proclaim to the nations that with you there is mercy, for you are the king. And we pray for that in times of distress, in times of deep yearning. We also praise you that we don't wait for our forgiveness. We thank you for the coming of your great, of the Messiah, who would come and offer that forgiveness through giving of his life, through establishing his covenant, and that we may be saved from the type of despair that's associated with not knowing when your forgiveness might come and that that only comes in you by your grace. Pray that you'll be with this congregation and remind us always as the psalmist sing, you are king forever, redeemer and Lord.